Hi, everybody. Happy Leap Day. And welcome to the Living New Deals webinar, A New Qu Deal for Quilts. I'm Susan Ives, Director of Communications for the Living New Deal. The Living New Deal's mission is to preserve the New Deal's legacy. We're documenting what the New Deal provided, jobs, infrastructure, parks, schools, public art, and importantly, a model of government dedicated to working for everyday Americans. You can learn more about the New Deal's history, policies, people, and programs, and search more than 18,000 New Deal sites across America at our website, livingnewdeal.org. While you're there, please sign up to receive the Living New Deal's newsletters and invitations to talks, tours, exhibits, and online events like this one. This is the first of several webinars we'll be bringing to you in the coming months. As always, we're grateful for your interest and your support, which makes programs like this one possible. Tonight's webinar, A New Deal for Quilts, is presented by teacher, historian, digital specialist, writer, Yannick and Smucker. Yannick and Smucker is a professor and historian at Westchester University in Philadelphia specializing in digital history, public history, and material culture. In her classes, she integrates technology and the humanities, working with students to create innovative digital projects. Her books include A New Deal for Quilts, which explores the federal government's practical and symbolic uses of quilts during the Great Depression. She is a former co-editor at Oral History Review, she hosts and co-produces Running Stitch, QSOS podcast drawing on oral histories with contemporary quilt makers. She's the consulting curator for Pattern and Paradox, the Quilts of Amish Women, opening in April at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. In her 2023 book, A New Deal for Quilts, which is a nominee for the Living New Deal's annual New Deal Book Award. She writes, quilts much more than mere bed covers have long empowered their makers and recipients in the face of adversity in both myth and reality. Whether in our collective romanticized memory, covering our bodies as we sleep or hanging on museum gallery walls, quilts are potent objects. And the US government harnessed that power to relieve the impact of the Great Depression. Please welcome Dr. Yannick and Smucker. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Susan, for that uh, warm welcome. And thank you, Elizabeth, for uh, getting us all set up and ready. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and we'll get going. <clears throat> I'm going to first tell you a little bit about myself, um, because I'm sure you might not know other historians who study quilts. Um, I, I grew up in a family of quilt makers. I'm at least a fifth generation quilt maker. You can see my mother and my grandmother quilting on my first quilt uh, around the frame that my great grandmother, um, my great grandfather made for my great grandmother. Um, and this is uh, when I was a teenager. Um, I, I love to have a project to work on, and I, I guess it was just in my blood. Um, I studied history and women's studies in college, and still, while I was making quilts in like my college houses and teaching my friends how to how to quilt, um, but I still didn't connect that quilts could actually be the subject of my my work as a, as a scholar. Um, eventually, I um, went to a textile history and quilt studies program at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and my very first assignment was. Uh, to conduct an oral history interview with a living quilt maker. And I chose my grandmother, Esther, who you see in the lower left photo. Um, this is from many years ago now. Um, and uh, this was her first quilt made around 1930. She became a prolific quilt maker later in life after she was retired in the 1970s and 80s. But this was the first one that she made around the era that I'm now studying. And I'm thrilled that I still own this quilt. Uh, it's been passed down to me. My grandmother sadly is no longer with us, 
Um, but I began studying quilts uh, as part of this textile program. And you can see me as a graduate student here. Uh, I was at the International Quilt Study Center, which is now known as the International Quilt Museum at the University of Nebraska. And I learned how to be a, a quilt connoisseur, identify patterns and fiber types under a microscope. And then as I um, continued into a PhD in history, I began to ask other kinds of questions about quilts, like what do they mean in American life? And as it turns out, quilts are really great to think with. And while I don't get to teach classes solely about quilts, um, I always find ways to bring them into um, the classroom and to have students understand that um, history can be learned from all kinds of primary sources, including uh, quilts, as you see here. Um, uh, just a little bit more um, about where I've come from, where I'm going. Um, I uh, My first book was about Amish quilts, uh, what happened in the 20th century when they were, quote, discovered by outsiders and became uh, renowned art objects hanging on museum walls. Um, I've long worked in the field of oral history, particularly with uh, as a volunteer with a project called Quilters Save Our Stories, QSOS, which is a project of the National Nonprofit Quilt Alliance, which is dedicated to preserving the stories of quilts and quilt makers. And now we use these oral histories, which we've taken off the old cassette tapes and digitized uh, um, in the podcast Running Stitch, which of course you can find wherever you find podcasts. And uh, today, of course, I'll be sharing um, some of my research from A New Deal for Quilts. It's also currently an exhibition at the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's up through most of April. If you can get there, you can see many of these fantastic quilts in person that I'll be talking about today. Um, just to start off with a big uh, academic thesis, um, this is sort of the, the overarching um, argument I make in, in uh, this current book. During the New Deal, the federal government embraced both the practical and the symbolic potential of quilts. They were teaching women skills that could support their families uh, in the form of quilt making, while also using quilts symbolic heft to generate empathy for poor and migrant families, drawing on the myths of the colonial era fortitude and self-sufficiency as a means of overcoming poverty. Already in the 1930s, quilts were very nostalgic objects and people were looking back to an imagined past of the colonial era, when people didn't really make quilts in, in large numbers, but that was what Americans imagined. And they used that as a way of helping them get through the Great Depression. So I started this project in earnest in the spring of 2020 when I had my first and only sabbatical from my, my position at Westchester University. Now, you might recall that spring of 2020 did not go how any of us imagined. And... Um, I was not able to go on any of the archival visits or museum visits that I'd gotten grant funding for or do much of any of the leisure activities that I'd uh, been excited about having this first break from teaching. Um, however, um, as you see here, as these 4-H girls tell us, there are difficulties, but also encouragement. As I began work on this project in the spring of 2020, you know, jumping into the research, first of all, these women older than me began to send me, who knew I was working on this, sent me boxes of research files or they would type up their research notes and email them to me. They'd send me images of quilts they thought I could use as part of my study. It was really a collective effort and I relied on that mutual aid, which is very much a depression era value. Um, I also soon realized in March and April of 2020 as the United States federal government had the largest outpouring of a, a financial package to lift the country up since the Great Depression, that maybe my research was more relevant than I even thought it was. And simultaneously, as some of you were probably at home learning how to make sourdough or speak Italian, many other Americans began making quilts. They were learning from YouTube and Instagram and finding their own digital online communities, just as many of the women that I'll talk about today were doing in uh, the 1930s. One of the women who was really thinking about both her politics and uh, her hope for the country was Fanny Shaw. And she made this before the New Deal even started, but it serves as a really useful bookend for this project. 
back before FDR was elected in 1932, and then he was inaugurated in 1933, supposedly Herbert Hoover used the phrase prosperity is just around the corner. In actuality, it was probably just the name of a pop song that was quite popular at the time as people didn't know that this was going to be the Great Depression. Um, they soon found out, but everyone was hopeful and looking and thinking, perhaps with false optimism, that soon the turn would come. So Fanny Shaw created this quilt featuring many of the, the neighbors in her community. We have teachers and nurses and cooks and bums and baseball players. We even have her own husband, who you can see in the detail shot here, who's tilling the fields, kind of almost oblivious to the Great Depression. He's been doing the same thing that he's always been doing. And in the final a lower right-hand corner, we see Uncle Sam arriving with the gold standard uh, farmer leaf and local beer uh, to save the day. You also might notice in the bottom row, both the um, GOP elephant and the donkey, um, who are also characters in, in this quilt. I think it reads like a graphic novel. This is just an extraordinary art, art work of art, but it also showcases what Fanny Shaw's hopes and dreams were in 1930-32 um, as she looked ahead, not knowing what the next decade would bring. The project, the seed of this project really started with Farm Security Administration photographs. So the, the Farm Security Administration, which I'll shorthand FSA, part of this, this alphabet soup of agencies, one of its initiatives was a photography project that was intended to document the plight of ordinary Americans during this time period. This wasn't a make work project in that it was paying out of work people um, uh, a, a salary to, pr to prime the pump, so to speak. This was hiring professional pho photographers to do documentary work in small towns, in sharecropping enclaves, in the migratory labor camps in California. Um, Dorothea Lang, who many of you may have heard of, was part one of the leading uh, photographers of this initiative. But anytime I needed, when I'm working on other quilt related projects, anytime I needed an old timey photograph of women working on quilts, I could find one. And I could find many. Soon I could find dozens, hundreds of photographs of quilts, whether they were like this one, a, a small quilting bee in a home in Iowa, or some of these other kinds of photographs. Um, we have a woman quilting alone in a smokehouse in Georgia. This is a, a the Helping Hand Club in Oregon that Dorothea Lang took a photograph of. They raffled this quilt off for $17 and used it as a mutual aid fund in case anything came up in the community. And many, many photographs of just quilts in use in homes like you see on the right. Now, I was... Of course, quilts were popular in the 1930s. Quilting was popular, but as we know, this photography project had a real mission to communicate the values of the New Deal. It was intended to create empathy among middle and upper class Americans who might have had some disregard for the, the legislation. It also was intended to communicate to the legislators that the New Deal was necessary and that it was working. So essentially, it's propaganda, um, you know, not the heaviest handed. And these photographs were shared in like exhibition form, published in magazines, but there are hundreds of photos that feature quilts and quilt making. So I began to think about what the message that the federal government was communicating through the use of quilts. And that's sort of the seed of the project. Soon it expanded as I learned that the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, which is really part of the second New Deal, uh, it created in 1935 as a make work project to employ out of work Americans to give them a paycheck that then they could also they could use to support their families and also spend money, continue to fuel the economy. The WPA sewing rooms were only eligible for women who did not have a father or husband that uh, they could be dependent on. So it was kind of hard to get these gigs. Um, and while you see three women here in Manhattan, these were sewing rooms in big cities. They were in small towns and in rural areas all across the United States. Um, these women, uh, it was inconsistent work. Sometimes they were very much set up like sweatshops with industrial sewing machines. Um, this one had a, a quilting project in which women made 
uh, pretty industrial um, comforters uh, as what you see here. Anything made in a sewing room, whether it was garments or mattresses or bedding, like you see, um, was distributed to the needy. It was never sold and women received a modest paycheck. There was a corollary project called the Handicraft Project, the largest of which was in Milwaukee, also part of the WPA. And this employed women who didn't even qualify for the sewing rooms. They were considered unskilled, many of them immigrant women, many African-Americans who had moved north as part of the Great Migration. Many did not speak English or were literate. And it was run, interestingly enough, by graduates and students from the art school, um, which is now uh, University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. They were art students there um, and they designed really high, high design objects, whether that was woodworking and book binding, uh, the appliques that you see here. And these were um, not distributed for free, but they were sold at cost to other state institutions such as orphanages and hospitals and nursery schools. And there were quite a number. There was a whole applique division making quilts like the one you see here. Here's another shot of a sewing room. Often there were they were, had a concentration on garment making in many of these sewing rooms, but then they would use the scraps as well as some of the commodity cotton. Cotton had, of course, tanked with um, the stock market crash and the price of cotton was so low that the government bought a lot of it and found other ways to distribute it. Um, so we see a quilting frame here with women uh, stitching on it, uh, on the quilt. Um, this is a Maryland um, uh, WPA sewing room. And here's another one from Tennessee. Octaself, uh, who's named in the caption here, since she has such an unusual name, I was actually able to discover a little bit about her. Um, she fits the bill. Her husband had moved out of state marrying someone else, leaving her with five children to raise. She moved in with her own parents, but because she had had a, a couple jobs outside the home, she'd worked in a doctor's office and as a telephone operator, she was qualified to be a, the forelady of this particular project, what they actually called the quilting project here in Nashville in the sewing room. This is a much more traditional patchwork quilt than the one you saw that was more industrial whole cloth quilt. And likely they were using the, the remnants, the leftovers from the garment making. Often these sewing rooms employed older women like the ones you see with needle and thread as they were probably widows or didn't have anyone else to support them. Um, and Okta was the supervisor. And um, I really love this shot in part because this is one of my very favorite quilt patterns. It's a monkey wrench, um, but you can see kind of the diversity of, of people in the scene. This sewing room, like some other sewing rooms, the women had to wear um, uniforms, which many women complained about because they felt it really stigmatized them as being on government relief. Here are a few of the types of quilts that were made in various WPA projects. On the left, we see, um, this is a, a double wedding ring, pickle dish style quilt uh, that Georgia Mize um, and her sister made using the scraps that they would bring home from a WPA sewing room that they worked in. In the middle is a quilt from the Handicraft Project. Milwaukee had the largest and most successful Handicraft Project um, in that um, they distributed um, quilts far and wide, not just quilts, furniture, book bindings, dolls, all sorts of crafts. Um, and other states and cities emulated it, um, turning to them as a model. Many of their objects were displayed in museums. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, Eleanor Roosevelt, lots of other dignitaries came and visited the Handicraft Project. And on the right is the very utilitarian whole cloth, meaning there's no patchwork or applique on the quilt. Um, this is a quilt um, that was made by FARA, which is the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, which is the predecessor to the WPA. So it's really part of the first New Deal, has a little different funding model when the WPA was replaced FARA in, in 1934. Um, and you can see the label not to be sold. So the, the quilts made by FARA and later by the WPA had to be distributed. Um, so this is a rare find to actually have that whole label and uh, a, a quilt, a very utilitarian quilt, not a decorative one like the other two you see here. Here is another decorative quilt that has become known as a, a WPA tulip quilt. 
Minnie Benberry was an African-American woman who lived in Western Kentucky. Um, there was, as she recalled to her daughter-in-law who became one of the foremost quilt historians of the 20th century, Questa Benberry, it was a WPA lady, a worker, who came and distributed this pattern to her and to many of her neighbors in this very rural enclave in Western Kentucky. I don't know if it would actually have been a WPA worker. As I've learned more about the various programs, I imagine it might have been a farm security administration worker. The home supervisors were doing this kind of thing. But who, who's to say uh, exactly where this pattern came from? WPA had become sort of a catchphrase for all of the New Deal initiatives to many Americans. When the women showed up um, in the spring to the churchyard, they were going to have a, a group quilting uh, where they all brought their quilt tops to finish. They'd all made quilts in the same pattern because they'd all been given this pattern by the WPA lady. And so they called it the WPA tulip quilt. These home economists, such as whatever this WPA worker or perhaps a farm security administration worker, or it could have been an extension service worker, which was part of the land grant institutions, uh, the federal funding. This predates the New Deal, but they had extension service home demonstration agents who would come out to families, rural families, and teach them the skills of homemaking. And here you can see a few shots. We see a woman in her overalls showing the lace she has tatted to the local home economist who's visiting her. And you see a couple other shots here, some pattern making that's occurring. And so these educated, often always college educated, often with a master's degree, they would come to these rural farm women and teach them the right way to do things, whether that was canning with a pressure cooker, uh, tatting lace, uh, gardening, or in some cases, uh, making quilts. They would often, often help them set up what were called curb markets, which kind of like what we would consider a farmer's market or a craft fair, where they could sell their goods as well. Home economists also were on staff in many of the planned communities of the New Deal. So the division of subsistence homesteads began establishing in 1934 homesteads, um, which were essentially these very organized planned communities. It was collectivism in which they would buy up land in a community where perhaps an industry had uh, fallen off due to the economic downturn. That was the case here in Tigert Valley, West Virginia, where the mining uh, industry had really tanked. And so the government bought up the land, divided it into little homesteads where each family could have an acre or so of land on which they should farm for their own produ uh, produce. Um, and they would also have industry so people could work half time Sometimes that was even like weaving workshops or other kinds of light industry manufacturing that was associated with whatever planned community it was. Every planned community, however, had a community center and every community center had a home economist on staff. And usually there were quilting frames and sewing machines and ironing boards available to the women of the community to use. Here we see uh, a home, a, a club meeting and uh, home economists often were helping organize these clubs, whether they were home demonstration clubs, sometimes called, or mutual aid clubs, sewing clubs, women's clubs. But here you can see them working on their patchwork. You know, the caveat, of course, is some of these photos are very staged. Uh, this is, looks like a pretty finished quilt that they ha just have draped over them, whether they're actually working on it or not is uh, for you to decide. But however, the government valued, I mean, these Farm Security Administration photographers valued taking photographs of women doing handwork on quilts. Gee's Bend, Alabama has become one of the most famous quilt making communities in the United States. And that's in part um, largely because of the discovery of Gee's Bend in the 21st century, when art enthusiasts uh, began buying up the quilts made in this community, which were very graphic in nature, um, used a lot of scrap material, and they, uh, there were curated ex exhibitions. I'm sure some of you saw these um, exhibitions touring to various art museums around the country. However, the first time that Gee's Bend was quote, discovered was during the 1930s. Um, Gee's Bend was tucked into a nook of the river and the ferry had stopped running. So it was a very isolated community. It was a former uh, 
plantation during the institution of slavery and many of those same families stayed there as sharecroppers. But the federal government came in as part of the division of, of subsistence homesteads and bought up all the land and divided it up into these um, smaller um, acreage with new homes and a new school, uh, which the, these girls are in right now and also a community center. So here we see home economists that are working as part of the National Youth Administration, which was the, the young people's wing of the WPA. And uh, these young women are learning how to use these treadle sewing machines. So if you know anything about G's Ben quilts, you probably think of them as these very graphic, abstract um, works of art, but it's really interesting to think about how uh, the sewing machine and the introduction of these home economists in the 1930s may have shaped and influenced the kind of work produced in G's Bend. Here's another uh, shot from a planned community in Flint River Farms, Georgia. This is one of many, uh, or several at least, segregated planned communities in the Jim Crow South. And this one was particularly controversial when it was proposed as the white farm families that were nearby were really resistant to having African Americans being basically getting all of this government assistance because they thought that those uh that it would make other locals um uh scramble for higher wages. Um, in this shot we see here, which is at the community center in Flint River Farms, um, you can see the caption, um, they're, they're learning reuse. So the home economists during the 1930s, one of the important things they're doing is they're teaching the value of reuse and thrift. We very much associate those uh, values as, as depression era values, right? Well, they had to be taught by these Whole government employed home economists. It wasn't necessarily something that was intuitive uh, to these farm families. Home economists, uh, as a pro home economics as a profession and a, as a field, really developed in the 19 teens and 20s. And at that point, the emphasis was on uh, consumption, like teaching women how to buy factory produced products. Then they needed to make a major pivot during the Great Depression and switch back much more to a production economy, teaching women how to use, as you see here, handmade looms, uh, corn chucks, flour sacks um, to produce things at home. There were also sewing rooms and community centers at the Farm Security Administration migratory labor camps. These were largely on the West Coast. You're probably familiar with the narrative of many uh, migrant farm laborers moving West due to the Dust Bowl, and many of them sought work in California and Washington, Oregon, and the government was concerned about the living conditions that um, these migrant laborers were in, often in, you know, what we, we know as Hoovervilles, uh, also the kind of um, corporate camps that were associated with the farms, which were really really run down, just tents, basically. So these migratory labor camps were planned communities also, kind of more temporary, but they were designed by architects. They had lots of infrastructure, including community centers. And in this community center, there's a quilt frame. The ropes you see here um, are suspended to the ceiling, so you can raise the quilt frame up if you want to hold a dance in the same center. Uh, the woman on the left is carding commodity cotton. Carding is the process of straightening the fibers of cotton or another another natural fiber to make them all align. And she's working to make quilt batting in this photograph. And that again, this is commodity cotton supplied by the government due to uh, the drop in cotton prices. Another a division of the New Deal was the Federal Arts Project, um, known as Federal Project One. It had many divisions, including the Federal Writers Project. The Federal Writers Project employed um, out-of-work journalists, uh, fiction writers, various other um, white-collar professionals, and there were a number of different uh, writing projects. You might be familiar with the state guides that that kind of promoted. Uh, a given state's um, amenities and tourist attractions. One of the other divisions of the Federal Writers Projects um, 
were, were, there were a couple oral history projects. They didn't really know to call them oral history projects. They were folklore projects, including the ex-slave narratives. So this was interviews with people who had grown up uh, during the institution of slavery. And then by the 1930s were usually quite elderly. And much of what we know about life during enslavement, we know from these interviews. We have to, of course, take it with a grain of salt. This is being translated by sometimes fiction writers. So we don't really know always how much is accurate and how much has been filtered, how much has been elaborated. However, there are many accounts of quilts and quilt making found in these ex-slave narratives, including this one by Celestia Avery. We also have a handful of photographs that are associated with the Federal Writers Project, and this one uh, features Lucindy Jordan, who brought out her mother's spinning wheel. Um, spinning wheels were certainly uh, not the latest technology by the 1930s, um, but here we see one that has been saved and reminds us of the textile work that really would have been done uh, during enslavement. Another companion project of the Federal Writers Project was the American Folklife Project. And this one was very much intended to interview Americans about their rituals and leisure activities and uh, the, the folk stories that they would tell. Dorothy West was uh, active within the, the Harlem Renaissance. She was a, a creative writer. She wrote fiction. She actually published her own magazine for a time. But during the Great Depression, she, like many other writers, was out of work. And so she was employed by the Federal Writers Project. And this particular interview she conducted with Mamie Reese is all about quilt making. And I just love this one. This is one I actually teach with regularly. Mamie Reese had moved to um, Harlem as part of the great migration of African-Americans from the rural South to the urban North. But she's remembering her time in South Carolina when they would have these grand quilting parties and finish their quilts all together. And uh, it's just really a really lovely narrative. And we can get so much uh, color and understanding of how quilts were made. Again, we have to take it with a grain of salt. But these projects were doing early quilt documentation. We know about quilts because of these projects. We know about historic quilts because of these projects that were funded by the New Deal. The same is true for the Index of American Design, which was another part of the larger um, federal arts project. The Index of American Design was um, the brainchild of some New York uh, movers and shakers, cultural entrepreneurs who wanted to have artists and designers in the United States turn to American precedents rather than European ones. So they imagine creating a large portfolio body of work um, that would be inspirational to the designers of the future. To do this, rather than just take photographs of objects, they tasked um, commercial artists, illustrators, graphic designers with painting these hyper-realistic watercolor renderings of folk art, decorative art, commercial art from the 19th and 18th centuries. So Albert Mowry, who was part of the Kentucky division of the Index of American Design, we see here, and the paint that's a painting on the right. That's a painting of a detail of a quilt, and you can see him working on it as he smokes his cigarette um, in the left. And as I began to dig into the Index of American Design Archive, which is um, all at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, they've digitized all of the um, paintings. Um, the very generous archivist there also sent me all the data sheets so I could try to learn about the specific quilts that were being painted. There were over 700 uh, of the 18,000 paintings that are in the Index of American Design that feature quilts and quilt making. The dream of creating this widely distributed portfolio as inspiration for artists never quite transpired. However, it's now a great database um, at, at the National Gallery and we can uh, um, look at all of these works. What I really found interesting was trying to identify when I could the actual original quilt that the painting was based on. So the painting here is on the right, which is the detail shot of this honeycomb quilt that is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. 
New York was sort of the center of the Index of American Design because there were more artists there and there were also more museums there and more collectors of uh, decorative arts. But I loved getting to see this pairing of finding the image of the actual quilt that this painting was based on. Another documentation project um, was part of the Museum Extension Project. <clears throat> So the Museum Extension Project, which was most active in Pennsylvania, it existed in other states as well, focused on um, creating objects that could be distributed to public schools and to public libraries so that basically you're bringing the museum to the people so that people don't have to come to the museum. And believe me, this blows me away. The government paid people to learn to screen print so they could make quilt patterns. These quilt patterns were based on 19th century quilts. Um, the kind of 19th century version of this quilt would have been what we call a red and green applique quilt. So the colors would have been different. I love how they've been modernized to be 1930s colors in, in these renderings, these screen prints. There was a, a quilt guild in southeastern Pennsylvania in the 1990s discovered this portfolio of quilt patterns. There's like a, a number of them that exist, mostly at public libraries or archives today. And they tried to follow the directions of these patterns and they said these quilt patterns are unusable. No one could have made a quilt from them. They weren't uh, <laughs> readable, they weren't usable, the dimensions were all off and so forth. Um, so we see here uh, the kind of screen printing that emerged um, from, from the Museum Extension Project. The Museum Extension Project did a whole bunch of other things, made a lot of dioramas, made models of Independence Hall, uh, made, made all kinds of uh, didactics um, for use in libraries and schools. There were also a great outpouring of quilt making by Americans, including many who sent quilts as gifts to Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor was known to be quite a quilt enthusiast. I have not been able to document whether she actually owned quilts. People would call her a quilt collector. We do know that by the time after FDR died, she distributed lots of the things that had been sent to the White House as gifts. They didn't have to use the same kind of rigorous recording of gift giving that um, the White House has to use now. But these Romeo sisters who were so-called experts in American quilt making, and these are very, these are like the two most popular quilt patterns of the 1930s, a double wedding ring and a grandmother's flower garden. But the local newspaper in California wrote an article about the girls and featured these photographs. There were also other quilts sent to the Roosevelt's. I, I think there must have been dozens, if not hundreds, um, but it's very hard to document. These, a, a couple of these are known now because they have documentation, including the letters that were sent with the Roosevelt's, uh, with the, to the Roosevelt's with the quilts themselves. So the, the, the quilt um, with the fringe on it is now in the FDR library. You can see that those are quilted dollar signs um, throughout uh, the, 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 the Eagles. This is not the NRA that we know today of the National Rifle Association. This is the National Recovery Act, which used this blue eagle as its logo. And the blue eagle, um, if you hung it in your storefront or put it on the package of the thing you uh, you manufactured, indicated to consumers that you were following a, a set of labor standards. And this was a very popular program of what we call the First New Deal. Uh, it was ruled unconstitutional by 1935, so it didn't really have the lasting legacy of some of the other initiatives in the New Deal. But people had such loyalty to this Blue Eagle hanging the sticker in their window, it would be um, distributed through post offices, um, like posters of the Blue Eagle. And I think that probably such quilts as you see here may have like also been in, put in storefronts as a symbol of the loyalty to the NRA. But as you can see with these five different examples, this wasn't a standardized pattern. This was very much a grassroots, like lots of people wanting to make quilts, showing their loyalty to the NRA. Similarly, the people made quilts in loyalty to the WPA. You can see WPA USA at the bottom of the quilt on the left. The quilt on the right um, is a sampler quilt, meaning each block is different. And this was made by various work crews in the Oklahoma WPA. I have not been able to uncover whether these are work crews, um, you know, building highways or other kinds of infrastructure, or if they were actually sewing rooms. 
but each has a different number from from the number of the work crew that was made. Um, this is such a lovely quilt to see in person. This one's hanging at the International Quilt Museum right now. And the Tennessee Valley Authority also has quilts associated with it. The TVA um, dammed up uh, the, the Tennessee River um, in order to create rural electrification, but also to create leisure um, recreational activities by creating reservoirs. Now, the Jim Crow South um, primarily uh, followed the, the or the government followed the culture of the community, meaning they adhered to segregation in the projects in the South. That meant for the TVA that there was uh, African Americans lived on one side of the river in a small village. These are the workers working on the dam projects, uh, and white families lived on the other side, and they had different amenities, different kind of housing stock. Ruth Clement Bond uh, was married to Max Bond, who was the um, most senior African American employee of the TVA. So she was, uh, she and her husband had been had lived in the North, lived in California. They were not products of the Jim Crow South. So this was quite a culture shock to them. Ruth wanted to create a project for the women who were married to African American workers on the TVA uh, called a, a home beautification project. And by doing that. Um, she taught them various, to use lots of different local products um, to create uh, TVA rooms in their homes. And she designed this and several other quilt patterns. Now, these look nothing like all the other quilts you've seen this evening. Um, these look like Aaron Douglas murals like hung at Fisk University, an HBCU at, locally in Nashville, which Ruth must have been familiar with. Um, this is a really radical quilt design, very modernist. The name Lazy Man uh, was given to it uh, later in oral history interviews. It's hard to know whether this was a, a name ap applied to it during the time period. Um, when Ruth Bond was interviewed in the 1980s, she said that the, the white hand on, on the left of the man is the, the arm of the government pulling the African-American man to a steady life uh, with work, where the other, the guitar on the other hand, is, is pulling him to a life of leisure, and he's trying to decide which way to go. This is how she describes symbolism. There were a couple other patterns that she designed uh, and distributed, and mind you, these are not, these would be very hard quilts to execute. Um, even though the women in the community may have had some quilt making uh, skills, these are not typical quilts. You can see just how involved this applique is. Ruth Bond had never made a quilt herself. So she designed these quilts without being a quilt maker. Um, the quilt on the left, of course, is actually depicting the work with a crane. And the quilt on the right um, is based on the TVA logo, but the interns that were from Fisk University, the HBCU nearby, um, called it the Black Power Fist, which is really interesting to think of perhaps this uh, iconography of the Black Fist may have come from a quilt. Um, speculation, but it could be possible. There were lots of other quilts that expressed political sentiments that were made by grassroots quilt makers across the country. The one on the left was sent to the Roosevelt's. This is also from the FDR library. It recounts the, the 1936 election returns. Um, uh, the quilt on the right was a very, it was a published pattern in the Kansas City Star newspaper. Every newspaper, big city newspaper, little city newspaper, small town newspaper had a quilt column during the 1930s. In it, it was a syndicated column. Usually there were some famous name brand quilt makers and they would publish a quilt pattern and instructions, basic instructions and said you could mail in 10 cents in coin or stamp if you wanted to receive the pattern in the mail. But usually the patterns were such that you could look at the newspaper column and adapt it yourself. There was this uh, giddy up the donkey, the very democratic donkey. There was also uh, a corollary um, elephant um, for the for the Republicans. Um, but this, of course, uh, during the Great Great Depression, New Deal era, the donkey was quite a popular iconography. These are a couple other quilts that were sent to other elected officials other than the Roosevelt's. Uh, the one on the left was sent to John Garner, who was a uh, um, Roosevelt's first vice president in 1932, the eyes of Texas are upon you. 
And the quilt on the right was sent to a senator from North Carolina. And I love this one because it lists each state that voted for FDR in 1932, 1936, and 1940. And you can see it's like they're it's like the electoral college map in quilt form. There was also commercial consumer culture that really tried to get in on this as well. Here we see um, the uh, Roosevelt Rose quilt, which was a pattern uh, created by Ruth Finley. She was a she was a quilt entrepreneur in the in the twenties and thirties, teaching about quilt history, usually a very mythologi mythologized version of quilt history. But she loved the pattern names of nineteenth century quilts, so she created this quilt to call it the Roosevelt Rose in honor of Franklin and Eleanor. And the quilt on the right is uh, these portraits. Um, stitched and painted into the cloth of Eleanor from various eras of her life. Uh, here is an example of one of these uh, newspaper column quilt patterns. Um, this one is commemorating the Warm Springs Foundation. As you know, FDR had polio and uh, he would go to convalesce in Georgia in Warm Springs where there, there were hot springs. And it was known as the Little White House. And this pattern um, commemorates uh, the Little White House. And this is a quilt um, from the Little White House State Historic Site, which still exists in Georgia. There was a major quilt competition in 1933 that spurred uh, additional interest in quilt making across the country. Um, it was sponsored by Sears and Roebuck, uh, coincided with the 1933 World's Fair, which was in Chicago, called the Century of Progress World's Fair. And the grand prize money was $1,000. So it was like trying to win the lottery, essentially, during the Great Depression by making a quilt to enter into this contest. And over 25 thousand quilts were entered into this contest. There was an additional $200 that you could receive if it was an original quilt. And these are both original quilts. Sadly, the quilt that actually won was not an original quilt. And it was kind of a scam. It was a woman who employed people to make a quilt and she kept all the prize money. But these are two highly original quilts. And the one on the left features a portrait. You can see the four um, faces that are surrounding that central medallion. The one on the lower right is of FDR. The quilt on the right is hanging in the exhibition at the International Quilt Museum, and this is called Calendar. The inner ring is the seven days of the week. The next ring is the 12 months of the year. And this was a farm woman in southwestern Pennsylvania who created this stellar original work of art. I don't know why either of these didn't win and uh, the one that did win. We'll never know. There was another quilt competition in 1939 associated with the World's Fair that was in New York City. And I'm using this quilt as the bookend. Kind of remember Fanny Shaw's very graphic, um, almost comic book-like quilt, uh, Prosperity is Just Around the Corner. I see this as the next chapter. Mary Gasparic was an immigrant from Hungary who moved to Chicago with her family as a young woman, as a teenager in the, around 1908, I believe. She didn't know anything about quilt making. She brought her own needlework skills from Hungary, needlepoint and um, embroidery. But she saw quilts from that 1933 competition because it was based in Chicago and she was intrigued. The Chicago Parks Department set up quilting clubs uh, at the local rec centers throughout the city. And she joined one and became a prolific quilt maker. She clipped every newspaper published pattern of every quilt and then adopted them and made highly original quilts, as you see here. This is a quilt she called Road to Recovery. Um, it has a very interesting backstory as it was discovered by me. I was giving a, a Zoom quilt talk a couple years ago at the American uh, Folk Art Museum in New York City. And a woman later saw the video on YouTube and she tracked me down and emailed me and told me about this quilt that her grandmother had made called Road to Recovery, entering it into the 1939 World's Fair quilt competition. I know that you might not be able to see all the quilting details um, through our Zoom connection, but here you see 1937, 1938, and those dates of the Depression go all along this path that you can see in the full quilt. The detail of this quilt is just fantastic. Uh, the family generously loaned it, not just for the book, but also it's hanging at the International Quilt Museum in the exhibition right now. 
if you can see the woman, this is the woman, Mary, she quilted herself into uh, the piece. Um, and this, even this boy, this sweater, I'm sure you can't see this level of detail. She knit that sweater and then applicated onto the quilt. The, the workmanship on this is just phenomenal. And it's her testimony of having survived the Great Depression. Here she is on the other end of it. And the obelisk uh, represents, this is actually the architecture that was featured in the New York City World's Fair in 1939. So we see how American quilt makers harness the power of the quilt as well, as just as the federal government was using quilts um, symbolically and practically in its relief and reform programs. I'm gonna thank you at this point in time and open it up for questions. Um, this QR code um, will take you to uh, the website for this project. Um, you can also just find me at yannikin.org if you wanna uh, learn more, see more photographs, order the book, uh, any of the above. I'm gonna stop the share now and I'll turn to our hosts and I know we have some time for questions. Thank you so much. I had no idea of all the New Deal connections of this um, craft form. And this was a really comprehensive talk and we're probably gonna run over our time because we do have a lot of questions. Well, great, um, we'll take them. Um, in case anyone has to go, um, I just wanna show you um, Yannickin's book. As you can see, it's, a, it's kind of a door stopper. And it uh, includes um, a lot of S FSA photos and color plates of many of the quilts that you saw here and more. Um, and the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska is the publisher of A New Deal for Quilts. And they've been hosting an ex exhibit on which you consulted. How did that come about? Well, um, I have been, I, as I mentioned early in the talk today, um, I was a student there for my master's degree in the textile program. This was back in 2001 through 2003. But um, many of my the people I worked with when I was a graduate student there are still on staff, and I've remained um, quite close and have worked with them on various projects. Back in 2000 or 2020, when I was really working on this in earnest, I was on sabbatical and you know uh, wanting to um, dig in, send out a book a book proposal. I turned to a, one of my colleagues there, Maren Hansen, and asked her, who's publishing good quilt books these days? Like, who should I pitch this to? I wanted to be able to have like a large crossover audience. I don't wanna just use a, a university press. And she immediately just said, send me your proposal. We just um, signed a partnership for distribution with University of Nebraska Press. And she said, and we'll do an exhibition too. Um, this is not how book publishing usually works. I got super, super lucky. I had good relationships with them. They had the quilts. They knew I could do the scholarship. Uh, um, so I sent them the proposal and the proposal expanded over time, of course, as I kept learning all these new things that I didn't know uh, at the onset of the, of the work. Um, but the exhibition is just beautiful. It was stunning when I came out for the opening in October, getting to see these quilts, particularly since I'd been mostly seeing them as digital images for the last four years. Um, getting to see them in person was uh, really um, mind blowing. Uh, if anyone lives anywhere close, it's right off of I-80, make a stop while the exhibition is up. There's also a great, they do have a great um, virtual gallery online um, that you can find if you Google International Quilt Museum. Thanks, yeah. Well, we've got a bunch of questions, but I just wanted to know if it would be possible to go back to that slide of Dorothy West mm -hmm. and read some of that interview that you admire sure. so much. Let me get my share back on. Um, so I'll, I'll read this in case the, the type is, is very small. Um, did you ever hear about quilting parties? We used to have quilting parties at least twice a year. One time we would meet at one house and one time at another. You'd keep on that way until the quilt was finished. 
Well, say there'd be three or four ladies who were good friends. If I was making the quilt, I'd set up the frame in my house and the other two or three ladies would come to my house and spend the day quilting. I'd have it all ready for the quilting to start. Maybe I'd have been sewing scraps together for a year until I got the cover all made. Then when my friends would come, the cover would be all ready and there would, wouldn't be anything to do but start work on the padding. If there were four ladies, each would take an end. I'd take this end, the other two would take the ends over there. You decide before how you were going to make the stitches. If you're going to have a curving stitch, you'd sew one way. If you're going to do a quilt block fashion, you'd sew that way. Um, and you can see there's uh, parentheses that that uh, that Dorothy West, um, the, the writer, would like add to kind of elaborate on this. And this is just, you know, one paragraph really of a longer interview. These are all archived at the Library of Congress. Um, you can easily find um, by typing in uh, in the in the search at the Library of Congress these names. Uh, find the full interview. Thanks. Um, how did the New Deal continue to change American quilt making following the Depression? Well, this is something that really started to occur to me towards the end of the project is I was like trying to write a conclusion. I hate writing conclusions. It's always so challenging. Um, and I realized that, and I, this was based on some oral histories I'd heard and some anecdotal evidence. And, and so it's not something I can necessarily prove, but if we look at quilt making throughout the 20th century, it really dips in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And then there's a big quilt revival that starts in the 1970s that coincides with the bicentennial and also the women's movement as people begin to appreciate women's traditional crafts. Um, and that is only expanded now. And the, the quilt revival, maybe it's, we're in a new quilt revival now, perhaps. It's even bigger. It's a multi-billion dollar industry now. But that dip that occurs, I think that many of the depression era women, women making these quilts out of their feed sacks and their recycled garments and uh, scrimping and saving, making them because they needed quilts to keep warm, really making them as a salvage craft, which hadn't been true during the 19th century so much. People were using new industrial produced cloth, part of the industrial revolution, but they need to make them as salvage crafts during the 1930s. By the time the economy picks up in the 1940s and 50s, they're so eager to buy a chenille bedspread from the <laughs> department store. They don't want to make quilts. Particularly if you were working in a WPA sewing room, you would associate quilts with drudgery, not with this homey craft that you want to like indulge in. People were really excited to engage in consumer culture by the time the depression had fully lifted. I know some of the depression era values, of course, have lingered, um, but I think for some people, I think the dip in quilt making, we can at least in part attribute to wanting to get away from those depression values. So the, the exhibit at the, the International Quilt Museum in Nebraska, that's specific to New Deal quilts, is that correct? Yes, um, they have several exhibitions up at any given time. Um, they have a lot, the largest publicly held collection of quilts in the world. Um, so there's, it's always rotating. Um, this is an exhibition that I curated um, very to, to go along with this, this book. The book and the exhibit are uh, go hand in hand. And so are, are many of those quilts in, in private ownership as well? In most, I would say most of those quilts, I would, I think probably 10 of the 14, and it's, you know, quilts take up a big amount of room. Like think of them as big works of abstract art on the wall. Um, most of those are from the International Quilt Museum collection. I believe three were on loan from Michigan State Museum collection. They have a, a large quilt collection there as well. And then the Road to Recovery, that quilt that I ended the presentation with was a private loan from the family. Right. And will that exhibit be traveling to other museums? Uh, if other museums are interested in it, I'm sure uh, the Quilt Museum would love to have it travel. I, I know they've put together a proposal. Um, I haven't heard plans or any commitments as of yet. Um, I want to shift for a minute and ask you about um, what, do you, what parallels do you see to contemporary present day um, 
stories or politics that um, that you know represent some of what was going on in the 1930s. Just this past weekend, I was at um, QuiltCon, which uh, is one of a couple really large convention level quilt um, shows. By by quilt show, there's like a juried exhibition of of quilts that people have submitted, and then there's a big vendor hall. And spending time in the quilt exhibition, many many quilts have a political perspective, um, just as many of the, these quilts that we talked about tonight. Um, there, the best in show quilt um, was a testimony to um, the kinds of tools that children and teachers need in schools to defend themselves against shooters, um, against gun violence in schools. Um, that was just one of many of the social justice issues and political issues that was presented in the quilts. This is not new. There are, you know, there are 19th century versions of abolitionist quilts and prohibition quilts and sanitary fair quilts from the Civil War. Um, but we continue to see quilts being used to express political perspectives, often ones that are kind of uncomfortable because the quilts as an art form can kind of ease in these very uncomfortable topics. And so it's surprising. It's surprising. There's another quilt that had um, an AK-47 like in the center panel and then the names of each of the children that had been shot at Uvalde, Texas. You can't look at this quilt and not be moved. Um, it's really powerful. So we continue to see quilts being used in, in as political expression. We also see, saw, particularly during the darker months of the COVID-19 pandemic, people taking quilts, quilt making up as this sort of solace, just as many of these women during the depression did as well, as it's a leisure activity, one that you can also do with your friends. During COVID, of course, we weren't doing this in person, but people formed online communities on Instagram, on learning quilt making from YouTube. Uh, there were all kinds of um, groups, digital online groups formed, like, like quilting bees, except in digital form, where people are still turning to one another for mutual aid and support and how to, how do I do this technique? Um, so we see a lot of these same uh, impulses in uh, contemporary quilt making. Yeah, I'm thinking about the AIDS quilt that started out here in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and I think grew to be acres, acres. Oh, right? enormous, so large. And now it's like broken up into lots of smaller segments that tour the world. Right, mm -hmm. right. This has just been so interesting. I want to thank you so much for, for coming and talking to us today. And um, I just... Um, I just am really grateful to learn about these New Deal connections. There's so many more questions, but I think we're out of time. I just want to make a quick reminder of our upcoming webinars. On Tuesday, the March 26th at 5 p.m. Pacific, we're going to be talking to Cheryl Kaskowitz and Catherine Kirst about the little-known WPA music unit and the soundtracks that resulted from its folk music collecting. Many were recorded by one of the WPA's most prolific collectors, Sidney Robertson Cowell, who headed the California Folk Music Project. And on Tuesday, April 16th at 5 p.m. Pacific, Doug Lean of Ranger Doug Enterprises will talk about his lifelong quest to find and preserve the iconic WPA National Park posters. So I'll just Chime in and say if there were questions you'd really like to hear me answer, feel free to email me. I know my email address was on the final slide. It's jsmucker at wcupa.edu. I'm I'm sorry that we ran out of time for everything. Oh no, it was all worth it. It was so really valuable. Thank you. Great. And thank you to everyone who came um, to hear Yannicka today and for all your support for participating and for participating in tonight's webinar. We hope to see you again very soon. Thanks again.